Please welcome a panel on COVID vaccine manufacturing and distribution. Well, hi everyone, welcome. I'm Liz Schreyer, President and CEO of the US Global Leadership Coalition. What a powerful conversation we just heard. I, but I'm always thrilled to be part of the Concordia Annual Summit, and I'm honored to moderate what is gonna be a very timely and important conversation with an outstanding panel of experts. Let me just say a few words about our conversation then introduce each of them. You know, earlier today, I presented a flat point presentation on the Concordia virtual stage. And I spoke about what will be Wednesday when uh, the administration will host a global COVID summit. And I spoke about the imperative that America and world leaders need to step up along with all of us who are not part of government when it comes to a global response to the global pandemic. Now, what's great about the conversation you're about to hear is that we're gonna spotlight what's working when it comes to the global response, particularly when it comes to development finance and public-private partnership, a, a core element of Concordia. But we're also gonna poke a little bit about what we need to do to up our game. I, I, I run an organization called the US Global Leadership Coalition, which brings a wide uh, breadth of the American public together uh, where I really get a front row seat of this public-private partnership, business leaders, nonprofits, farmers, and mayors from literally across the country. So I see how public-private partnerships are out there tackling the global challenges. So let's meet our panelists. They're real, they're three game changers. You meet David Marchek, the Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Dr. Vikram Paradkar, who it got up at, I think it's 1.30 in the morning in India, so a special shout out to him. He's the Executive Vice President of Biological E. And Jeremy Conondike, who is the Executive Director of USAID's COVID-19 Task Force and a Senior Advisor to the USAID Administrator. So gentlemen, welcome. We have just a, not Thank a long you. time to get through a lot of questions. And let me start with the first round of questions, which is really what's working. And David, I want to start with you. You've done a masterful job in a short amount of time making a huge contribution to the DFC. For those audience members who are less familiar with the DFC, this is an area where there's really strong bipartisan consensus in the US Congress that said, you know, America's really got to up our game when it comes to development finance capacity. And it's a relatively new agency, it used to be OPIC, now the Development Finance Corporation. I'm very proud to be on your advisory council. And, and what I want to ask you is I've seen in the first year this wildly impressive success story. You've committed almost $5 billion in new investments, 65% in low and lower middle income countries and playing this big role in the COVID global response. So David, start us off. What's working in terms of addressing the global uh, pandemic, particularly how are the public private partnerships fitting into your success? success? Well, thanks so much, Liz. And thanks, uh, it's great to be on a panel with Vikram and Jeremy. Um, I'm gonna be brief because we only have 20 minutes. We have three speakers. Early on, President Biden instructed all of the agencies to run, don't walk, to do everything possible to solve the global pandemic. And one of the things we realized was there was a huge vacuum in capacity for vaccines. Prior to the onset of the pandemic, global vaccine capacity for all diseases, yellow fever, influenza, et cetera, was around 5 billion. And we know that we need something in the order of 11 billion doses for COVID alone. We also know that the developing world does not have sufficient access to vaccines. And so what the DFC working with USAID and the White House and others did is we looked around the world to find vaccine manufacturers who needed access to financing, who needed partnerships where we could help them produce more. And Biological E is one of three investments we've made. Uh, Vikram can talk about the company. But in total, because of the DFC's support, the companies we're backing are gonna produce more than 2 billion vaccine doses between now and the end of the year in the developing world for the developing world. 
We've also financed two projects in Africa, one of which will produce hundreds of millions of vaccines in Africa for Africa. So normally what the DFC does is lift up lives. Here, what we're doing is actually saving Fantastic. lives. Well, Vikram, I'm gonna to come to you. Vaccines are being developed here. The DFC, as David just said, began looking for partners globally, enter Biological E. Powerful partnership, maybe even more so by the first deal with the Quad that focuses on producing vaccines. So how does DFC and Biological E come together and how significant is it for you to be producing a billion, billion J and J vaccines in India? Yeah, so uh, uh, BioE has been in the vaccine production business for many years. Uh, but the, the, the pandemic has actually brought us to the forefront because uh, we could deploy very large capacities. Uh, where DFC actually is helping us a lot is on the financing side so that uh, some of these capacities can be brought online very quickly. And uh, as you know, in vaccine business, uh, there is a lot of gestation period in product development and so on. But uh, 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 having a financing of this nature that DFC provides uh, gives us a lot of uh, assurance of our uh, uh, future demand for vaccines and so on. Uh, vaccines are not a commodity. They are specialized products. And so uh, uh, having a partnership with DFC gives us the exposure also to the potential markets for our uh, vaccine. Uh, and, uh, you know, we bring a lot of expertise of rapidly scaling up uh, vaccine production. Uh, and, you know, DFC brings the exposure as well as the financing so it's a win-win partnership. And I think uh, we are also very excited to, to contribute uh, a very large uh, supply of vaccine that we can supply globally uh, with the right quality, right uh, you know, uh, quantity, and uh, get the pandemic under control. All right, I'm gonna come back on a couple other questions for you. Jeremy, um, I wanna bring you in. You're clearly one of the difference makers in, in this storyline. You're on the front line overseeing efforts to what I'll call vaccinate the world. You're playing a key role in President Biden's commitment to provide 500 and a million, 580 million vaccine doses globally that have already been committed. We know that there's another big commitment that's imminent more than any other, every other country combined. Um, given you and I have talked often about, at ultimately this is about getting shots in the arm. We know that there are low income countries, places like Africa, uh, the, the continent, where, where their average about 2% of the population isn't vaccinated. So talk about what is working, but also how does the US um, with public and private partnerships ensure equitable distributions in vaccines? Jeremy. Thanks so much, Liz. And, um... It's great to be on this panel with my with my colleagues. Um, you know, what's working really well is a lot of people are getting vaccinated. Almost a third of the world now is fully vaccinated. The, the, the problem is that that third of the world is not uh, spread evenly. And so you have countries uh, like the U.S. And, and much of Europe that uh, that now are approaching two thirds or more um, of their adult populations vaccinated. Uh, South America is, is 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 a little over a third. And then uh, much of Africa is still under is still under five percent, and so I think the challenge now that's ahead of us is to is to is to lift all boats. Um, it, you know, we have to acknowledge that it has not been equitable in these in these initial months, but there is um, you know there are efforts underway to to shift that. I think the U.S. is doing a great deal to try and to try and um, uh, accelerate equitable distribution. We're doing that through the deal that the president announced at uh, at the the G7 back in June to provide 500 billion doses of Pfizer through COVAX. Those are those doses are beginning to roll now. Uh, we have shared more of our surplus domestic stock than any other country than all other countries combined. Um, uh, uh, more than 100 million doses of surplus share domestically. So you know we are uh, I mean, we are trying to lead the way, but um, more we need to do more, and we will be announcing more. But a, a lot of other countries need to be need to be upping their game as well. And I think that this is the challenge ahead of us is. There has been a great deal done. We also have to acknowledge it's not yet enough and we will need to do more. Well, let, let's talk about the next frontier and, and where we need to be going and, and stick with this manufacturing distribution. And David, uh, you're really leading in what I'm gonna call the next frontier initiative and what we're learning as we go along in, the, in this crisis. In June, 
President Biden and the G7 partners launched uh, Build Back Better World, or we all like acronyms, these B B3W initiative to narrow the 40 tr plus trillion dollar global infrastructure gap, including health infrastructure that's critical to preventing even the next pandemic. DFC is playing a leadership role here in catalyzing private sector resources to strengthen health systems. Talk about what you're doing and again, how manufacture and distribution around these vaccines is really gonna play a role and what you're doing around it. So thanks for the question. Um, you know, we've been running hard since day one of the Biden administration to do everything possible to end the pandemic. Just to give you a sense of the scale of what we've done, in the five previous years, the DFC has invested, or OPIC has invested about $125 million per year in health-related activities. This year, we're gonna end up doing five or six times that much. Not only in vaccine manufacturing, but also in health systems. We've provided uh, a product that, that ensures shipments of vaccines for about 25% of the shipments of the world. Um, so that if there's a spill or a breakage, the shippers are covered. We also are working with Gavi on a number of initiatives to help them get vaccines to a number of countries. Jeremy has done great work uh, leading the US government's effort on Gavi. And then the Build Back Better World Initiative actually came out of a conversation between Prime Minister Johnson and President Biden, where there was an, an effort at the G7 to basically say, we need to do more. We need to accelerate the amount and pace of financing for developing world and infrastructure. And we're highlighting and focusing on four areas. Obviously, we're in a climate crisis. We've seen the impact of global warming on the United States and around the world. And so we are doing everything we can to accelerate finance uh, in the climate space. Health is a second area. Third is on gender opportunities, gender equity. So we're doing a lot to finance opportunities for women owned and women run businesses all around the world, including BioE, which has a CEO and an owner who's a, a woman. And then finally in technology and telecom. We know that technology and telecom can have a huge positive impact on raising the uh, standards of living for people, on getting people access to education, to finance, to better people's lives. And so we're strengthening our, our, our investment pace to invest in technology and wealth. That's the Build Back Better for the World Initiative. It's basically the G7 countries banding together to accelerate finance in these areas for developing countries. So, so let's say to Vikram, so your country, um, we know and we all watched and obviously David's been involved in it as is Jeremy, your own country, which has witnessed tremendous loss during the COVID pandemic. So, so what does this mean for a company like Biological E to have the support to produce vaccines at home in India? Talk a little bit about that and how you see it moving forward and kind of what I'm calling this next frontier. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, we were not prepared to handle the pandemic, uh, probably a lot of other countries as well. And uh, uh, in India, some of these became magnified, the issues uh, about the lack of access to healthcare uh, capacity. And uh, the, the good thing was, uh, uh, I think, uh, vaccination, everybody realized, would be the uh, way out of this pandemic. And so India has uh, embraced the vaccination uh, uh, very well. And uh, we are on a, well on our way to uh, vaccinate our uh, entire population. And uh, uh, we also, you know, de developed vaccines uh, fairly rapidly within India and would be able to contribute uh, to get the global pandemic also under control uh, with the help of uh, uh, entities like DFC. Uh, I think you know, the, uh, the support that uh, we get from a, uh, you know, entity like DFC also allows us to uh, more like a seat at the table at some of the other uh, global engagements, which also uh, uh, gives us obviously more exposure. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, you know we can showcase our uh, uh, capacities and uh, help uh, you know uh, in these projects. I think uh, we definitely will do that for this pandemic, and uh, you know if something like this comes up in the future again. Great, um, Jeremy. The White House COVID summits on Wednesday. That certainly sounds like next frontier. 
What are you expecting in terms of commitments? How are you going to prepare the world leaders to rally around something we've all, I certainly talked about this morning, everybody's talking about it, this goal of 70% of the world vaccinated by next, this time next year. Well, it's it's an ambitious goal, but it's it's the right goal. It's going to take a lot of effort. And I think the summit is an acknowledgement and a call to action that right now the world is not on track. We're, we're, we're not collectively where we need to be. And it's very urgent that we get back on course. And so some of the things I was mentioning earlier, uh, accelerating vaccine donations from uh, high income countries, accelerating deliveries from some of the, the vaccine manufacturers to low income countries and to COVAX, um, expanding, you know, expanding production from India is obviously a, a, a very important piece of that. And the good work that DFC and BioE are doing is going to be critical in that. Um, and so, you know, it, it, the, I think the message is this is achievable. We, we can beat this pandemic next year, but we're not necessarily on course to do so, and we have to get on track. So in our last uh, few moments together, um, I want to ask you each to, to take about uh, just, a, just a moment to answer this. In, in this year, USGLC has launched our, our largest campaign to tell a story to how to ensure we, we never end up with a global pandemic again. And it's by really trying to understand what it's worth, you know, foreign aid, diplomacy, global health, what it's worth. And today we're, we're sitting here talking about COVID vaccine manufacturing and distribution to make sure we get shots in the arm, to make sure we have the scale to fight this global pandemic with a global response. So I wanna ask each of you to, to talk about in just, you know, 30, you know, 30, 60 second, what, what's it worth? And Jeremy, if I could ask you to, to kick it off, you know, what, what's this worth to get this right? Well, you know, I think it is, it is the, the return to a, a new kind of normalcy uh, on really almost every domain of our lives. Um, obviously, a lot of people have been lost in the course of this pandemic, but so many other forms of normalcy have been disrupted. Uh, children out of school still. Um, markets disrupted. Uh, one of the things that the U.S. is very seized with right now is the fact that if you go to car dealers in the United States, you can't even buy a car because semiconductor markets have been disrupted by this pandemic. And there is really, you know, that there are all these things that will not return to normal. Uh, and, and most important, that the risk to our lives will not return to normal until we can beat the pandemic, not just in individual countries, but everywhere. Thank you. Vikram, from BioE, from India's point of view, what's it worth to get this right? Uh, we never felt that this uh, pandemic would be upon us. I remember participating in some of the capacity building initiatives uh, six years ago or so, and those you know people were uh, uh, taking it uh, not very seriously because I think the, the the breadth of this problem was never imagined. Uh, now we have gone through this. I think uh, we have learned a lot, and I think. Uh, uh, one of the only good thing that has come out of this is uh, our capacity has now become enormous. We have demonstrated we can uh, really get together uh, cross-border, cross-continental uh, collaborations uh, and uh, vaccines have come up so rapidly. So the, the only silver lining of this pandemic is the learning that we have gotten and we are now very confident that the next pandemic, I think, will be able to uh, uh, you know address it much, much faster. Uh, you know, all the technologies are at our disposal now, and uh, uh, I hope uh, it will never become a pandemic. It will, it will, you know, be just diagnosed and very quickly extinguished. I, I'm very confident of that. Well, thank you, and thank, thank you for getting up, uh, staying up so late. And David, <laughs> development financing, public-private partnerships, these are big investments and important investments, but what's it worth? So I think I want to close with something that I've talked to you about, Liz, and that Senator Coons, uh, who really drove the creation of the DFC, has talked about, which is getting U.S. government entities like the DFC to accept more risk. We met BioE early this year, and within a very short period of time, we said we want to back them. That took risk. It took a risk appetite, and it took the team at the DFC moving extraordinarily quickly. BioE then built a new facility with our support, and they're not only going to produce large numbers of Johnson & Johnson vaccines, but they've also, working with Baylor University, developed their own vaccine. And the numbers of vaccines that BioE is going to be able to produce is just staggering. And because of the risk a small agency like the DFC took, 
literally hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people's lives are going to be saved because of their good work, BioEs, and also because a small agency like DFC could take the risk, move quickly, and support a company like BioE to help address and end the pandemic. That's something all Americans and frankly, everybody around the world can be very proud of. Thank you, gentlemen, for a fabulous discussion. It's an honor to be part of a virtual uh, Con Concordia annual summit with you. Thank you, everyone.